Okay. Uh, welcome everybody to this um, next session, this uh, exciting session on uh, digital therapeutics in brain health that we have today um, at our Biotech A digital partnering event. My name is uh, Patrick Fry. I'm the CEO and founder of Venture Evaluation. And we are also um, running this uh, conference, Biotech A digital partnering. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to welcome you and uh, uh, doing this, uh, obviously, this five days of partnering we have, um, we've had and we are having some very exciting panels and discussions as well. Some of them are uh, run and, and hosted by my friend Christian, who is uh, um, helping us with uh, some of the program. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, to thank you again for, for all your good work and the very interesting speakers you are able to, uh, uh, to recruit uh, for our event. And we will be recording this session as well and, and uh, all the participants will be, be able to uh, view it on demand afterwards as well. So over to you, Christian. Thanks very much to you and also to John, uh, who is uh, participating in, in this session. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Uh, a pleasure to be here. I'll keep the intro brief. Good morning, John. I'll come to you in, in, in just a moment. Um, I'm going to share a slide for a second because it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with Biotech Gates. Um, but the reason we're doing this stream focused on neuro, digital, and artificial intelligence innovation uh, is because we ran a summit and launched a new initiative in Lisbon at the Sean Palimo Foundation in October. That was a pilot project. We'll do it again. Uh, our speaker today, uh, John, is actually at the Sean Palimo for a period of time. I'm not sure how long because he's also at uh, Johns Hopkins and the uh, chief medical director and or chief scientific officer. John, I may have gotten one of those titles wrong at Mind Maze, which is a very interesting company. Um, the reason we're doing this neuro digital stream with investors, business models, treatment paradigms during Biotech Gate Digital is Biotech Gate was a key partner for this event with the Champalimau Foundation hosting the venue and the European Brain Council and other partners like Cambridge Cognition, Medible, the Brain Capital Alliance, eBrains, the Human Brain Project, the Applied Neuroscience Association, and of course the industry partners. Um, there is a real golden moment right now in digital health in the neuro and mental health space. Things are changing. There's excellent cognitive behavioral therapy and population health. There are real digital therapeutics coming from many different approaches. And John's going to talk to us. He is a, he is a KOL uh, professor of medicine. I'm not gonna get the whole title right here at Johns Hopkins and a researcher, uh, neurologist, psychiatrist, and the chief medical officer of Mind Maze. Uh, which is a very interesting company. So a departure from our usual big pharma and industry speakers, but Mind Maze is a growing company. And if you're in the space, they may be able to partner with you because they are up and running uh, with some very interesting assets. John, I hope I've done a, a semi-decent uh, introduction for you there. Um, the title we've given is Digital Therapeutics in Brain Health, an Alternative Care Journey. And I'm looking forward to this. I've seen your colleague, Naveed, do an excellent talk. I haven't heard it directly from you. So I'd, 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 I'm keen on this. And I'd like to say to the audience, we will take questions uh, after John goes through his presentation. So any questions, just type them in the chat and we'll get to them. And with that, John, um, thank you. So should I, thank you. Should I share my screen? I, yeah, that would be great. Um, do you have uh, authorization for that, or if I not, think Connor, I, do. We'll I, I, th I think I think um, I think yeah. it's there. There it is. There it is. Uh, is that okay? Um, should I put it into? Uh, no, like, I can no. see this just fine, but I'm on a large screen. If you can go to uh, presentation, that may be easier. Is that is that okay? That's perfect. Um, so thank you, Christian. Um, Yes, I was sorry to have missed that um, summit in October in at the Champagny Mo. And yes, yeah, so I, I am a visiting scientist there. I'll be going there for sabbatical in the summer. Um, and it's true, I'm you know I have a you know professorship at Hopkins, which where where I'm primarily based, and also at the Santa Fe Institute. And then I am the chief scientific advisor at and medical advisor at Mind Maze. 
Um, so it's a lot of hats. Um, I'm not actually a psychiatrist. I'm a neurologist. That's the one thing that I should um, <laughs> correct. Um, so I think I'll just try and put this into context. I'm actually in quite um, interested in the fact that this you're mainly listening to pharma, big pharma, because I'm actually going to, I hope in a respectful way, speak against big pharma, and at least say that it needs um, a partner or an alternative approach to run along with it. Um, and let me go into that. Okay. So this is actually um, a still from the kind of environments, immersive environments that we're creating uh, for patients. Um, this was done by an artist at Kato, which was the software and hardware design studio we have at Hopkins. Um, so um, a year or two ago, um, I was asked to review a book, uh, a theory for cure and um, about health called What is Health by Peter Sterling, a professor of um, neuroscience um, at uh, Penn. And it's a wonderful book. I can't recommend it enough. Um, in fact, we're thinking of having a sort of what, what is health panel uh, next month at the Champlimeau. Um, and so I reviewed it. I wrote an essay about the book and I call it A Theory for Curing the Disease of Modernity. And this was the opening and it was in the middle of COVID. Um, I'm not gonna read it out to you, um, but basically, um, it was essentially it was about this showdown between a virus and a hyperconnected but politically fragmented world leading to what my brother at the Santa Fe Institute has called a complexity crisis. Um, and essentially we had an infectious disease come up against non-communicable chronic disease. In other words, poor diet, sedentary living, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, addiction. Um, and in a sense, I wrote that the virus x-rayed the health of the modern world and exposed its latent vulnerability. Um, and it's a long story about why the world is so unhealthy. The WHO estimates that about a half of people over the age of 65 worldwide do no voluntary uh, you know, physical activity of any kind. And one of the things that led me to write this is I thought it was kind of interesting that everyone quite rightly was praising the speed and efficacy of the development of the vaccines. But no one talked about why we hadn't as speedily cured the diabetes, hypertension, obesity, sedentary living, and the incredible vulnerability of all the people who died, beginning with the horrors in Bergamo in Northern Italy. And I found it kind of fascinating that, um, that one kind of illness, you know, infectious disease uh, was, you know, succumbing to the reductive monotherapeutic pharma approach, but no mention about why it hadn't worked for all those chronic, chronic illnesses, right? And so I write here, um, how do we treat diseases of modern civilization and aging? Well, the Western medical establishment's answer was, and largely still is, to bring the monocausal, monotherapeutic framework that has done well for acute infectious disease it and diseases and force it onto non-infectious chronic disease. It's in essence, every disease, no matter its dimensions or mechanisms, should ultimately yield to this one molecule, one drug at a time approach. And with all due respect, it's been a failure when it comes to chronic diseases, right? Uh, chronic diseases are not honorary infectious diseases. And we only have to think about the aducanumab fiasco uh, to realize that there's this desperate requirement to finally find a pathway or a molecule or work for in a disease like AD. Um, and it's just not working out. Now, of course, I am not saying that there won't be in our armamentarium, um, you know, a drug pharma solution, but it needs to, I will argue today, desperately needs to run in parallel and synergize with lifestyle, behavioral, long-term interventions. Um, and, you know, in a sense, the world is responding to this vacuum by getting into the new medicine, which is now a $4 trillion industry um, already. Um, and here you can see uh, a magazine released by the New York Times where they talk about things like CBD, mindfulness, exercise, food. You're all aware of the massive hype around psychedelics, which is a delicious sort of hybrid case of behavioral experience fused with a 
with a drug. And of course, we can't talk about that today, but it is a particularly delicious sort of manifestation of this sense of lack right now. Um, and now in the book, um, What is Health, that opening passage I read, the review, wrote the review for, um, is really an attempt to take a more rigorous approach. In other words, be just as scientific, be just as evidence-based with respect to the areas covered on that in that green magazine and think about it in a rigorous way. And Peter Sterling, as I said, a professor of neuroscience at Penn wrote this book, What is Health? And it basically explains why you're gonna to have to think differently about chronic diseases, multi-organ diseases, complex diseases, system-based diseases. And he gives the example of blood pressure. When the brain commands a rise in arterial blood pressure, blocking one peripheral mechanism leads the brain to drive others harder, thereby requiring additional drugs. And I can tell you, as somebody who attends on the stroke unit at Hopkins, I can tell you there are many occasions where you see patients coming in on four or five blood pressure medications and still not being able to bring down their blood pressure. A therapeutic system based on blocking cerebral command seems unlikely to succeed. A more promising strategy we suggest would be concentrate on restoring social and psychological health, thereby reducing chronic conflicts between brain-centered and body-centered regulation. A therapeutic system based on brain-centered regulation would begin not with antihypertensive and anti-diabetic polypharmacy, for example, but rather by enhancing sleep and exercise, both of which improve health. So in other words, what we have to see digital therapeutics as an opportunity for is to bring technology and science into the realm of prescribable better life, exercise, cognition, sociality, sociality and sleep. Right. So in other words, it's not I roll, I roll, yeah, take your Lipitor, take your antihypertensive, take your antiplatelet. And you know what? You should try and take a brisk walk at least three times a week, you know, sleep well, watch your diet. But a doctor can never prescribe for those things. And so they don't really figure. And in fact, those kinds of lifestyle approaches don't even get into trials anymore, into drug trials. In other, in other words, lifestyle behavioral interventions are considered apples versus oranges. And so drug trials are usually drug A versus drug B. You don't have lifestyle alternative C, which is really a problem. A problem, And one could tell the story about how that came about. So again, what we're talking about here is trying to get a bead technologically, prescribably, on alternative non-pharma interventions that we know work, right? The thing is, is how do you package them? How do you parcel them? How do you track them? How do you dose them, right? That's the real challenge. And I think we're getting to a point where we can do that. Um, now, one of the things we know from almost every animal model of disease that has been looked at is that three things seem to really cause significant improvement, both with biomarkers and with behaviors. Um, one is it's if you put these animals, whether they are diabetic, hypertensive, obesity, Parkinson's model, if you put them into enriched environments, in other words, they have toys, they have spaces to explore, they have friends, um, you always get an improved response on an outcome measure, multiple, multi-scale outcome measure. The other thing we know is that cardiovascular exercise, for example, here the rat on its wheel. And then finally, for neurological conditions, where there's a focal abnormality, let's say a hemiparesis, task level training against that backdrop of A and B um, is highly beneficial. So I wrote a book back in 2017 where I sort of went through the history of all this, and it's basically a history that has been, in a sense, ignored. But what I proposed in that book and what we're proposing at my maze and what I'm going to show you today is that what we really want to do is to combine A, B, and C systematically at high dose and high intensity for humans. All right, so this enriched story has been around for about 75 years, and we not at all clear why it hasn't come into medical care. It's almost as though we want people to feel in these hospitals that they're in, that they're having a dress rehearsal for the morgue. Um, we shouldn't be doing that. 
Um, I, what I would like to say is if you're going to be sick, you might as well enjoy it. Okay. So in other words, make it immersive, make it social, uh, and of course, harness these true scientific effects that up till now have not been amenable to prescription. Um, this is the science behind enriched environments. This is a review um, from Nature Reviews Neuroscience back in 2019. And basically, you know, there are many routes in to enrichment. You can see that on the left. You can have sensory, motor, social, and cognitive. So in other words, you can multiplex the input. And then you can look on the right at all the levels, multi-scale that this has an effect on. Um, now, the critical point about looking at that box on the left is that the temptation is to go, yeah, yeah, but can't we just hone in on the really important active ingredient? Can't we look for it, find it? You know, can we slay the goose that lays the golden eggs and just find it and turn that into a drug? And the answer is no. You have to have all of it, right? It's no more likely to work than thinking that you could substitute your child's education with a pill. Don't go to school, take this pill. Um, never going to work. And one should think the same way when it comes to these multi-component chronic illnesses. So People enrichment would pay a lot for that pill though, John. What was that? People would pay a lot for that pill. If it right, did work. But it's, right, but it's a fact, yes, they would, but you know, people will pay for fantasies all the time. Look at how Marvel does so well. Um, <laughs> Enrichment works through interactions of physical activity, social interaction, and cognitive challenge through play. These elements are not independent. They must be considered together rather than in a reductionist way. Enrichment is a complex content with emergent properties. And the basic idea, I think, behind complementing you know, the established way of treating patients is that complex diseases need to be matched by complex emergent interventions. In other words, if, if you're trying to treat something complex, it's not likely that you're going to be able to fix it with something simple. You're going to have to match it in its complexity. So what would an enriched environment for patients look like? And how would should we promote playful, non-task-based exploratory behavior like we know the rodents do when they run around the page and play with the toys and run up the ramps and play in the wheels and explore novel spaces, right? So the, the inspiration for us was at Hopkins was to say, well, maybe you could take the movement and cognitive and social joy of animation, which we all love, and try and go a step further and simply go from being making it a passive input like we had in the four components of enrichment that I showed you, but have a motor, cognitive, immersive participation component. So become Pinocchio, basically. So that's what we developed, a kind of immersive neuro animation uh, where you simultaneously are being cardiovascularly challenged like the wheel. Um, you're training on movements like the rat doing prehension, C. So that's B and C. And then A, it's the character, it's in a world, you have to help it, you become it, that's A. So we thought we could get A, B and C by basically making you a moving, cognitively challenged character in a beautiful environment. Now, not Pinocchio, but um, a dolphin. So that's me. Um, that was actually a picture taken by National Geographic and they did an article about this. Um, and essentially the idea is that you're in a room, the lights go down, the music goes up, there's a large projection, you're in the ocean, 2D, but it has 3D depth. Um, and then that's an exoskeletal robot that had to be used because this is a stroke study. So you needed to do weight support not in the direction of movement. This is not assistive robotics in the direction of movement. It was anti-gravity so that they could practice with their residual cortical spinal tract and not let the weakness mask their residual dexterity. Okay, and the goal is to be bandit and to swim in the ocean and eat fish, play around and avoid sharks. So here, I hope this works. This is just a part of the gameplay. So you get an idea about how immersive and fun and lovely. And, and, and you should know that this animation is, you know, I'm obviously biased. It's now been acquired by MindMaze, hence the connection to MindMaze. This is now a, a product in the digital therapeutic repertoire of MindMaze. Um, we call it digital medicine. It's a room-based immersion. 
this is not a screen in a room or in a gym. Um, so let me show you. So you, you get the idea, right? You're basically in the room making huge arm movements. You're steering the intention of Bandit. It gets more and more difficult. There's an AI feature where your opponents get better and better as you go. Um, and unbeknownst to the patient, they're doing a workout. They're being cognitively challenged to strategically beat smarter and smarter opponents. And of course, they're making all the arm movements to train capacities that are outside of a task context. And this can be done in the trial, for example, we did in stroke, which ended up being twice as good as regular therapy. They had to do an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, five days a week, to three weeks. So this is a major workout. And one of the great challenges in chronic illness in, in general and neurological disease in particular, is how do you keep people to adhere to the high levels of athlete levels of training that are really gonna be required to actually have an effect on these diseases. And so, for example, we have data, which I can't talk about today using SSRIs, that many of the drugs that have failed in the neurological space, ironically, perhaps could have worked if they had been done against a highly intense, high dose, enriched, immersive behavioral environment. In other words, this is the real lesson, is that you're just going to have to accept that the drugs are going to have to be combined with intense behavioral experiences, because that's what the nervous system is. It's a experience dependent plastic system um, and so i think that's very exciting that as we get better with our digital therapeutics in our software as a pill that it will probably combine well with a pill john um i've been trying not to interrupt but just a, a quick question what was the the retention of the patients in the trial on that uh Two, two a day, one hour workouts. Um, that's a lot, even compared to the regular gym goer. As you said, that is athlete level. Um, yeah, training. right. So, so it, retention, as in, did they keep doing it, or did yes. they have did the bet? Or did the bet? Well, it was a three week intervention, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, so in other words, there were residual benefits three months and six months later. But uh, you know, at my maze, I should say that we're very much planning to have a homework system at home which is there to track you make sure you don't develop bad habits don't revert back to the way you were alert to deterioration and then you should cycle back to the neuro spa so in other words the model i'm beginning to envisage is highly intense high dose bursts over we've done three weeks for stroke we've done 12 weeks of parkinson's disease and the retention there was a hundred percent that's amazing that's yeah. Right, because it's beautiful. In other words, you know, that's the other thing that you know I'd like to say is unfortunately, digital therapeutics is people think about it as you being alone at home on an app. I think that's a race to the bottom. I think that's the way that we should not be going with digital therapeutic. I think the world wants to go out. You want to go to restaurants, you want to go to movies, um, you want to go to parks. So I think the ideal thing would be a gorgeous location-based experience like those mice in the cage with their friends in a fun space and then you would back it up as a secondary with home-based apps and smart objects but that would be in secondary that would be to maintain what happened at the location okay um okay. i hope that's clear it, it is it is it's a very interesting model and i i think you know the reason i ask i think rehabilitation for anything um, it's hard to get patients to comply uh, and continue even, you know, their 30 minute um, rehabilitation. Well, then, right. I mean, ju just on that point, just before, this is not rehab. First of all, this is neuro restorative. This is digital therapeutics. In other words, it's extremely important not to conflate this with rehab. Rehab is great, but rehab is a 
is, is learning how to cope with what you have left. It is pragmatic, it is short-lived, and it depends on motor learning. It has nothing to do with rewiring the nervous system, has nothing to do with training capacities. Rehab is like being a weekend warrior. Neurorestorative digital therapeutics is like being an athlete, and they are totally different. Okay, so okay. this is one of the things that is gonna to have to be learned, right? If you, if you practice on your new espresso machine two or three times a week, over a couple of weeks, you'll make a good latte, all right? But that is not going to turn you, that level of practice, into a major athlete, right? Athletes need to practice five or six hours a day, every day for the rest of their lives. And that is what patients with neurological and chronic disease need to do, right? I mean, you simply have to be an athlete of your illness. And if you're gonna do that, you're going to have to do things that are so beautiful and immersive that people want to do it, just like they want to go to the movies. I mean, we were in fact visited by Pixar and we were invited out to Pixar, okay. But there's a type of cheap off the shelf, plastic, linoleum, mat and rubber ball approach to rehab that no teenager would tolerate in their video games and no doctor would tolerate in any of their other specialties. Okay, so in other words, we've got this triadic system we've got regular rehab which is great to train you how to cope with what you've got left then you've got this appification to death where everything is remove humans make it an app and stay home and disintegrate into loneliness or what i'm arguing you can create these gorgeous immersive social infrastructures geared specifically to aging and chronic illness and neurological disease in particular um so here, this is an article that I wrote for the Santa Fe Institute with Michelle Carlson, professor of public health at Hopkins, where we basically talked about what happened, as I was mentioning in the article, COVID spiraling frailty syndrome, where certain people died fast from COVID. And the, the feeling was that many of them had frailty. In other words, this complex multi-organ condition that about 10, 5 to 10% of the elderly get. And Linda Freed, who was, at, was actually at Hopkins when she defined this syndrome, frailty, and she basically makes this point. This is because, and she thought physical activity was the way to treat it. So she was thinking before we came along with technology and digital therapeutics that you could just exercise. And she argues this is because physical activity simultaneously upregulates many systems that mutually regulate each other in combination. That's the whole organism could be retuned to a higher functional level. This offers a model intervention that matches well a complex system problem. If monotherapies are not sufficient, then finding an intervention that tunes a critical mass of systems would be critical. That is the promise of digital therapeutics, if done right, as I argue, as an immersive location-based multiplexed intervention, not apification. And then finally, we've just completed a trial with Michelle Carson where we installed this. Um, in, a, in my view, this was a trial that so wasn't aesthetically up to the room that I want and what we're installing commercially. Um, but you know, these were healthy elderly who lived in an assisted living facility and they played this three times a week for an hour of six weeks. And you know, this was an, um, a feasibility study, but there was already signal at the level of grip strength, a frailty measure, and psychomotor processing speed. And one of the interesting things to your point is that, oh, that's them playing. Sorry, I should show you that. And they get completely hooked. In other words, you can't distract them, right? And, you know, and what was very interesting, an emergent thing that happened is they played alone in this auditorium, but they created their own social space. They created their own trophies. We had nothing to do with this. So they created a <laughs> dolphin trophy after you had completed. Um, so in other words, this is what I mean. You have to have people all in one place. They have to be able to talk about it over lunch. There has to be an immersive social component. And, you know, and after this- you were seeing what? improvement here, even without the exoskeleton. Um, well, these are just, these were, just, just these were, standing these were, in the movement and so forth. Yeah, right. And this is healthy. These are not stroke patients, which is what the okay. robot was for. Okay. And this trial, and this actually led to us being funded by the DoD here in the U.S. to mm -hmm. do the same thing for war veterans after traumatic brain injury to prevent progression to Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So that's ongoing now. Um, and then we have. Um, 
a beautiful space being built at Johns Hopkins at its main outpatient center, which is a it, it's called Green Springs. So we're in the middle of construction of this Zen-like space to do phase two trials and have patients come and experience this neuroanimation. And as you can see, it's gorgeous and it makes patients realize that they're being taken seriously and they too deliver, deserve um, high quality enriched environments. Um, and then finally, you know, the kind of teams you need to do this are unusual, right? You're, you're gonna need artists, computer scientists, neuroscientists, therapists, all working together, which is extremely atypical. I mean, one of the things I'm proud of, proudest of was being able to assemble such a team in a medical school. Um, and then in the, in, in the middle, we have Omar Ahmad from Meet Roy, Jero Wimbley. Omar Ahmad was actually a Disney Imagineer for a while. He's a computer scientist from Meet with most valued programmer um, at Microsoft and NVIDIA. Um, and Jero is an artist who's done many posters and artwork for Marvel and the comics and Star Wars and things like that. So you need this level of expertise, um, even un, in research conditions, to work with the more traditional clinicians and scientists in order to create these customized, purpose-built digital therapeutics. And I will stop there um, so that you have a chance to have a go at me. That is uh, a whole new challenge in uh, in executive search and recruitment um, from the biotech or the health side or the med tech side, um, going well beyond the comfort zone of the typical recruiters and HR directors and CEOs. So that's that's pretty amazing. Um, John, what kind? I have some questions uh, in terms of the learnings from this for digital health in, in, in the neurological space more broadly. But maybe let's start with some specific questions. And again, for the audience, if you have any, just use the Q&A. Um, in terms of uh, indications, you're using this now in stroke. What other, what other indications uh, do you have in development, either this or let's say similar programs where you're using this sort of immersive uh, program combining A, B, and C? Um, so we've completed a 30 patient study in PD. As I said, we have a DOD study ongoing in TBI. Um, we did a study, as you said, the bright view that I showed you was in healthy aging. Um, we have trials, pilot trials ready to go in MS. Uh, we have an ongoing much larger acute stroke trial going on in New Zealand. Uh, we have a acute stroke trial with the maintenance at home trial at UCSF. Um, but my view, and then we're going to, and we're thinking of starting concussion, that, the, the, that this cardiovascular, social, cognitive, motor skill combo is universal. It's what the nervous system wants, no matter what it does. So in other words, based on the evidence and the fact that physical activity and enrichment work in any disease you look at, yeah, this and, is, and, and this is so. This is universal, basically. And going from acute traumatic injury, whether TBI or 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 concussion or or stroke, for that matter, to neurodegenerative diseases, um, I guess as you those are really diverse. And I guess as you say that that is universal. So that's very interesting. Um, in terms of the approach, the the rewiring, and uh, sort of the 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 post-stroke, and again, I don't want to use the rehabilitation, but the recapacitation of, of, of patients or the, the neural rewiring. Have you looked, you mentioned the need for drug trials to consider involving physical activity and enrichment to get the, to reach the endpoints they want to see and see the efficacy. And I think that's really interesting and perhaps another conversation. And, and, and by the way, on that note, there's so much data supporting that. I mean, with all, I mean, I hope I don't want to offend anyone, but, you know, companies just don't want to do that because they hate the idea that they're going to have to have their baby associated with someone else's baby in order to get the effect, right? So in other words, I, I, I feel, and, and it's very interesting to me how pharma think about digital therapeutics. In other words, I'm being very strict in my use of digital therapeutics. I'm talking about when the software is the medicine not mm -hmm. just a platform to take it better, not a platform to make people comply with taking their pills, et cetera, et cetera. It's not measuring things like their blood pressure. That's all fine. I'm talking about 
an intervention instead of pharmacology, right? Yeah, I, and I think, I, and, and I think, and that's what I'm saying is there's a reluctance because, you know, which I, and I think maybe that's changing, but for the nervous system, when I'm saying based on evidence we've generated and others, that you are shortchanging your pharmacological intervention because you're not actually including it with our dog. <laughs> and I say that yeah. half tongue in cheek, but that, it, look, remember this conversation <laughs> i no, i think you're right and i think we are on the pharma side we are seeing some changes some of the big pharma are very focused on digital health as companions to their to their to their pharmaceutical interventions um of the sort you mentioned but there are others looking at alternative care journeys and 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 digital therapy as an alternative to pharmaceuticals so it's starting i wonder with earlier stage companies uh, it's probably a pricing issue and financial resources as well in terms of what trial can they afford. But if this is a way to uh, get better outcomes, then, then, then the argument becomes much more persuasive and we may see something of a shift over time. But um, I mean, but, but can I just a question about that? I mean, the outcomes for the drugs in this space have been dismal. Yeah. So, so in other words, why are you saying that we have to show improvement in outcomes when the drugs have shown dismal outcomes and yet they still keep getting developed? So in other words, I mean, there's a double standard there. There, there absolutely is. But from the investor perspective, they either, they either fund it or they don't, right? So if they, if they don't believe it has a shot, they won't fund it. And sometimes if, it, if the, I have seen neurological drugs where the FDA was keen on a pivotal phase 2B and the investor backed out because it was five million more than they expected, right? And, and that asset froze on the drug side. So cost does become an issue for investors, but I, I take your point. I think it's a very interesting. Um, I wonder when we're looking at uh, partnering, if you look at it or if my, and I realize you're not on the commercial side of, of, of my maze, you're on the scientific and medical side. Well, um, I mean, I, I'm, I, I kind of am because I, I feel like, you, you know, I'm sure all of you here, it, it's a, you, you, you can't really just dissociate them, right? Because you have to understand what the form factor is gonna be. What do you want the experience to be like? And then of course you have to ask, you know, how are you going to actually do that? Is that gonna be reimbursed, covered, private payers, self-pay? You know, it, it's 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 always in the back of one's mind, right? When you introduce something brand new, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that you know, who wants a patient to have to go to the equivalent of Juilliard or college to get better, right? We have you know, shortening lengths of stays. We just want them to go and look at the opioid crisis, right? There was a time when pain was multidisciplinary: psychotherapists, physical therapists. You had the whole thing, um, and then along came opioids. Yeah, you know. So the opioid crisis is part of this monotherapeutic culture. Same with psychiatry. We haven't had a really novel agent, perhaps now with psychedelics, we shall see, for 50 years. It's all been variations on the same receptors and transmitters, right? And that, and what happened there? You go back to the late 19th century, early 20th century, there were places you went, orchards, stables, art classes, social things. Then we got lobotomies, and then we ended up with SSRIs. So in other words, there's, a, there, there's basically a belief, particularly in the US, that there's the pill for every aspect of life. Because to be social and complex and interactive and multidisciplinary and multi-confidential is simply not seen as a moneymaker. Yeah. Um, and when you can't approve something as a drug, the solution is still to make a pill and sell it as a supplement and pretend it's not a drug. Um, <laughs> I don't want to go off on a tangent on psychedelic therapeutics, but we are working on a project with one of your neighbors uh, in, in, in Lisbon um, to do a responsible innovation in psychedelic therapeutics. So I'll come back to you on that because I think it is a very interesting space. But I wanted to ask you, I've seen some companies, and I'm not going to remember the names right now, which are working on other I wouldn't say digital, but neurotech uh, approaches which extend the period of neuroplasticity post stroke. Uh, is this something that might pair well with the sort of approach that you're doing to, um, you know, to to aid in the recovery? Or, or would this be too complex to sort of build that sort of, uh, you know, package a trial? 
that way? Well, well, no, it's a great question, and I completely agree with you. I'll give you, you know, concrete examples. You know, you've probably heard of the great work that Gregoire Coutin and his team at EPFL are doing with epidural spinal cord stimulation um, mm -hmm. on on patients. Um, now, that's interesting because there, the epidural stimulation can be both seen as assistive, assistive, and restorative, um, and that's an ongoing debate. Um, but that's associated to work with three hour sessions several times a week for months and months up to a year to get the epidural stimulated to show its benefit. So it's a beautiful example of having to combine the tech with behavior. Um, we had just gotten a big grant in Pittsburgh. I'm going there today, actually. Uh, a Marco Cupper Grosso is an engineer where they, we've been inserting epidural electrodes into the cervical spinal cord of chronic stroke patients. And we just got the money now to try and conduct a trial where we'll combine the epidural stimulation of the cervical cord for stroke with our immersive environments. So in other words, I, we just wrote an article, David Petrino and I, he's a neurotechnologist in New York, where we make the case that if you're going to use neurotech, and when you say extend the plasticity window, I, I'm wondering whether you mean something like vagal nerve stimulation, which we can talk about. Um, but the conclusion we reach in that article on neurotechnology that just came out in the last week or two is that if you want to piggyback neurotech, it has to be on new behavioral interventions, not regular rehab. So another problematic is that the pill approach has spilled over into neurotech, which is, so maybe we can just implant a vagal nerve stimulator or whatever, and we can just add it onto regular therapy and we'll get a multiplicative effect. No. Again, you can't shortchange, you can't shortchange the, the novel behavioral approach. In other words, what you have to get right first is a new behavioral approach that isn't regular rehab. And then you start to piggyback drugs and tech on top. Do you see? It's not the other way around. Yeah, I do. And, and, and I think that's really interesting. And I find myself thinking about some ecosystem type questions. Maybe one, the idea was, you know, the question here was, were we going to offend any pharma people? But uh, I, I think the question also is on the digital health side, there are a lot of application based digital therapies, some of which are, you know, really just wellness games, not really therapies, some of which are aiming to show clinical efficacy in some in some neurological uh, indications or, or, or in mental health for that matter. Um, is there a need, a lot of startup companies are not coming out of medical schools and they may not have the sorts of multi-institution resources and external funding that you were able to put together when you developed this uh, yeah. with uh, Hopkins, uh, the Santa Fe Institute, and um, I, the other one was in New York, I believe. Um, is there a, a need for somebody on, to provide on the healthcare space, whether a clinic or something like the equivalent of the Cambridge Innovation Center to provide a facility where projects like this could be piloted, yeah, so that they could be adapted. Uh, 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 absolutely, yes. That's what we're trying to do with the warehouse at the Champlain Mall. I mean, that's what the event, you know, in two weeks is going to be. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, we badly need some, you know, the equivalent of MIT Media Lab in the healthcare space. So, where, so yeah, absolutely, yes. I mean, we need a place where you know, the clinicians and the creators and the companies come together um, and do basically phase two trials in these spaces, you know, and implementational trials and real world use data and things like that. I mean, without a mosh pit like that, it's very, very difficult. So, so John, this is maybe something to take <laughs> up after the call, but I'll, I'll say it right here because it may be interesting for those watching now and those who will watch the recorded version, uh, Pavel Svoboda, who's the director general of eBrains and the or the director general of the Human Brain Project, and the CEO of eBrains in Europe, they are working mostly now in the in the in the deep brain implant space with the Center of Excellence in Europe, but they're also working on technologies and miniaturization within the network, and looking at building some sort of facilities where um, you know some of the they weren't looking at a testing uh, facility for clinical trials, um, but they were looking at building capacity around 
some of the technological components that go into brain technology. So I wonder if this is something we could get them on board with, because that would bring an EU wide sort of network and political. Yes, it sounds like a, it something. sounds it, it, it sounds fantastic. I mean, I think we would have to persuade them. I mean, a lot of what's happened, I'll give you the robotics case. You know, it, a lot of the technology developments happens uncoupled and the companies and the business types and the engineers what I have found, and I've been to almost all the places, is they've never actually seen a patient. They don't even know what the disease is. In other words, I, I could at most of these meetings on digital therapeutics probably humiliate most of the people there very fast by asking them, so tell me, when you examined and looked at a patient with this disease and you get this stricken look, because they don't really spend any time. I think anyone in this space should spend at least two weeks, if not a month, rounding with people like me every single day. That so is to, to, an so, excellent so, idea. Yeah. So Actually doing point, rounds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so to your point about having a space that isn't for phase two trials, the problem with that is that you end up having these two ships in the night that, you know, that, that never, you know, they just pass each other by, right? Because the tech is being done and people just at their laptops project economic estimates and revenues and and they never actually deign to go into the hospital that may just to be up the hill from where they are to so, see so what actually happens. And so I would have to I would claim that these spaces, if we could persuade them, is have to have both. So that, 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 that I think is a really good point. Some of what you mentioned is not unique to neurology. We've seen this going back a decade or more in digital health and health tech. Uh, but I think there is an opportunity to do something because some of these big stakeholder organizations do want to build something and there's an opportunity to help them shape how they're going to do that. So I may ask you at some point to get on a call with Pavel and some of the others mm -hmm. and see if we yeah. can influence the direction that ship is going in. Uh, because there, there might be an opportunity to do something which helps the ecosystem as a whole in terms of uh, accelerating and enabling innovation. And, and I, I do take your point that we need to start earlier than that. And um, Consulting with clinicians and patients is one thing, but doing rounds, I think, is a, is, is a brilliant idea. And it's probably going to scare people away, but those that do... Well, it, if it's scared, but, if it, but, if it, but if it scares them away, in my view, I mean, to be blunt, they shouldn't be in the space. In Fair other enough. words, yeah, I, th I think you have to have domain knowledge. I mean, look what happened at Boeing when the engineers stopped being in charge, right? Yeah. I mean, there's an, amazing, there's an amazing article in The New Yorker that ended up as a book, and it was precisely when... Donald Douglas fused with Boeing and MBA types took over and started cust cutting and cutting corners. And it's harrowing to hear about how safety and engineering is compromised. And I think it's exactly the same when it comes to patients is instead of having the goal to safely as you know, bring passengers from A to B or have a patient be transported through their illness. It's how can we make money out of the patient? Right. And what I'm saying is, you could you would make money if you actually did something that works. There is a, perhaps a parallel argument in pharma when they they took the uh, the chemists um, out of the drive out of the driver's seat and put the MBAs and marketing types in in uh, in charge of product launch and so forth. But I don't want to go too far in that direction today, John. Uh, oh, we have a question here. Uh, we haven't had many, but. Um, well, the question so far is, dear John, uh, so I'm going to give that one a minute and, uh, and see if the rest of the question comes through. <laughs> um, I've caught somebody typing a multi-part question. Um, I, I, I really appreciate you joining this. I hope uh, next October, and we'll know the dates, we'll nail them down with Joe and uh, in the next few weeks uh, for October next year for the summit in Lisbon. Uh, we will do one, if you're interested, on psychotherapeutics in Austin, Texas next year, um, psychedelic therapeutics. So uh, that might be fun if a slightly different area. But, no, it's, it's, um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, we're, we're trying right now. We've done some psychedelics in, in mice and we're very much about to launch a, a psychedelic stroke trial, but it's, you know, it's quite hard to get that off, off the ground for all sorts of reasons. I mean, I just want to say also is that 80% of DTX right now is psych, mental health, um, because neuro is hard because it's full body, right? You have to be able to track and intervene 
at the level of the full body, not just at the level of the brain. So that's why the neurospace is relatively empty, right? Um, I, whereas you can, you know, if you're, you know, if you have insomnia or drug addiction or depression, you know, there it's more feasible to have it on an app, as we know some companies have. And I'm not knocking that. You can do that, even though I think that full body exercise has an effect on mental illness as well. But the neurospace is really difficult because you need to be able to both intervene and track limbs and language and cognition and so people have shied away from it relatively speaking compared to mental health yeah and i and i think also post covid there has been uh an increase in attention and an influx of public funding and investment capital so so we're seeing an acceleration there but i i take your point that 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 neurology is is very hard um Listen, with that, I really appreciate that. This video will be shared with the broader 1,000 plus uh, partnering community. They won't all be joining. Um, we didn't have a huge turnout today, but we'll also share it with the Neuro Digital Innovation Summit Network. Uh, so I think we'll get some views there. And I look, um, I look forward to following up and I will try to coordinate with you and see if we can get a call with Joe, uh, with, uh, with Pavel at, uh, the human brain project in Europe. Yeah, and, and, and I hope, and, I, you know, and perhaps you're somewhat relieved at the turnout so that I, that I wasn't able to offend, offend as many people as I was hoping to offend. No, I was hoping we'd get a bit more <laughs> of that, to be honest, but I, I, you know, I think, uh, I think it's the change of the, you know, the last, the change of session from Tuesday to Wednesday and so forth, but it will get views, it will be in the platform and we will share it with our network. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, I'd like to thank you, John, have a great day. Congratulations on the new grant and have a good trip over to uh, Pennsylvania. Thank you, take care, bye. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.